Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Health equity means that no matter what color your skin is, no matter what your income, you are treated well, you get access to health care. Fighting poor birth outcomes begins before conception. And I think the challenge really is that there aren't enough, that, that, that we're going backwards uh, with our long-term care spending. Differing opinions on the best approach to caring for Louisiana's elderly. It gives them a level of voice and engagement. The Super Bowl of spoken word poetry. Hey everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a minute. But right now on SWI, we look at some of the week's top headlines. Emails released show Secretary of State Tom Shedler used his state email account to send sexually suggestive messages to a longtime employee who is suing him for sexual harassment. Shedler has said their relationship was consensual. Senator John Kennedy is calling for Shedler to resign and says the emails show he crossed the line and abused his position. A Taiwanese company has selected St. James Parish for the location of a $9.4 billion plant project. Formosa Petrochemical Corp. bought 2,400 acres of land on the Mississippi River south of the Sunshine Bridge. The project would create 1,200 direct jobs with salaries averaging almost $85,000 annually. Construction of the complex, which would produce ethylene, propylene, and ethylene glycol, would begin as soon as 2019. State and local governments have offered the company $1.5 billion in incentives, primarily in local property tax exemptions. Obamacare marketplaces have been scrutinized for being unprofitable, but Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana has broken from that trend and posted a $59 million profit from its marketplace policies last year. The 2017 profit comes after three years of losses and double-digit premium increases for policyholders. Exchange policyholders will see an 18.5 percent increase in premiums this year. This week, Governor John Bell Edwards and First Lady Donna Edwards attended the White House State Dinner with President Donald Trump and French President Emmanuel Macron. They were the only Democrat politicians invited. Senators Bill Cassidy and John Kennedy also attended the event. The menu included Carolina gold rice jambalaya cooked in a New Orleans tradition, but Cassidy is reported to have said the dish was more like rice pilaf. No chicken, no sausage, no seafood. While in Washington, Edwards also met with federal officials to discuss the Comete River Diversion Canal. FEMA has extended the temporary housing program for survivors of the 2016 floods through August 15th of this year. The program provides homeowners with low-rent mobile housing units, or MHUs. FEMA has also imposed incremental rent increases, but the state is in the process of appealing that decision. Louisiana is a step closer to striking a Jim Crow era law that allows divided juries to settle criminal cases. The House Criminal Justice Committee voted Wednesday to advance a constitutional amendment to require unanimous verdicts in serious felony cases. Louisiana trials, including some murder cases, can be resolved when 10 out of 12 jurors agree on a person's guilt. Senator J.P. Morrell, a New Orleans Democrat who sponsored the bill, said he traced the jury policy to an 1898 constitutional convention where lawmakers were trying to maintain white supremacy after the Civil War. I don't want to hurt Facebook and I don't want to regulate them half to death either. Those were the words of Senator John Kennedy after he and Minnesota Democrat Amy Klobuchar this week introduced the Social Media Privacy and Consumer Rights Act of 2018. 
Said Kennedy, our bill gives consumers more control over their private data and requires user agreements to be written in plain English. A first this week in coastal restoration solutions for our coast and our wetlands. You had state officials, Terrebonne Parish officials, plus a host of private sponsors at the edge of a wetland destruction area in Chauvin. That's where they made the announcement. Now, this is what the area looks like right now after years of wetlands loss. And the projects at Point of Shan and Bayou Terrebonne will look like this. America's Wetland Foundation is spearheading this effort. This project is a new breed of uh, activities in Louisiana for three reasons. One, it's a very unique partnership where we're bringing together a corporation, a supplier of native plants, and the, a foundation, the America's Wetland Foundation, to partner with LSU Sea Grant, all the Sea Grant colleges around the Gulf Coast, and uh, the Rotary. For many women in Louisiana, it's a scary place to be pregnant. Our state ranks 45th out of 50 in maternal mortality. We are 48th in infant mortality. LPP's Kelly Spire spoke with Department of Health Secretary Dr. Rebecca Gay to find out what is being done about these outcomes. That's right, Andre. Officials started implementing solutions after infant mortality spiked in our state about 10 years ago. But as you mentioned, we're still at the bottom of many national rankings and there is still more to do. Louisiana is at a disadvantage when it comes to birth outcomes. Louisiana is one of the poorest states in the nation. And of course, when we look at birth outcomes, poverty has a big impact. And we consistently rank 49th or 50th worst outcomes. Dr. Rebecca Gee now leads the Department of Health, but prior to that, she served as director of the Birth Outcomes Initiative, and she is an OBGYN. Poor outcomes include infant and maternal mortality, as well as maternal morbidity. Morbidity is the neck, is the step underneath death. That's something like a very bad hemorrhage, or you have a clot to a lung during a birth, and you're dealing with it. The woman survives, but some of these are avoidable, and our goal is 20% reduction in avoidable morbidity over the next couple of years. Under Guy's direction, there has been an 85 percent drop in elective deliveries before 39 weeks of gestation. I led the effort to reduce prematurity for the state and to tackle infant mortality, and those efforts were very successful. So in the last 10 years, we have reduced infant mortality by 25 percent, which is incredible. We have reduced neonatal intensive care unit emissions by 10 percent. To do so, the state has taken three direct actions and has followed one core principle, health equity. Health equity means that no matter what color your skin is, no matter what your income, you are treated well, you get access to health care, and um, you have the ability to have a healthy outcome. Health equity is important because African American mothers have significantly worse outcomes than white women in Louisiana. Black women die at three times the rate of white women because of pregnancy. Black babies are born at double or more the rate uh, prematurely uh, than white babies. And the medical community doesn't understand why. We don't know why black women uh, are more likely to have these outcomes. We have some idea, right? So black women are more likely to be obese. Black women are more likely to have diabetes and high blood pressure. And black women are more likely to be poor. But it's more than just that. The data shows that even black women who look just like me, have a medical degree, have all the same types of opportunities, both financial and educational, also have a higher chance for poor outcomes. Why? We don't know. There are some ideas. Racism may have an impact on a person's health over the course of a lifetime. That could be affecting pregnancies. There are studies being done now looking at the stress cortisol access. Uh, cortisol is what we release when we're under stress. And there are theories, and some of them are supported, that when you have racism and you have racial bias against you every day of your life, that that has an impact on your stress levels and your overall health. Guy says expanding Medicaid has improved health equity. The first of three actions the state has taken to improve outcomes is improving preconception health. You have to be healthy going into a pregnancy. Prenatal care is not enough to undo the impacts of a lifetime of chronic disease. Providing women who have had prior preterm births with a hormone medication. 
if you've had a prior preterm birth and um, that birth was was happened spontaneously, you are uh, needing progesterone. It's a medication that's an injection that's given weekly, and we did very poorly on progesterone administration. So that's been a very very big push for us for the past five years is making sure that everyone who's eligible gets progesterone. And lastly, helping women get access to adequate birth control. When women have pregnancies too close together and they're not able to heal in between pregnancies, particularly if their prior pregnancy had a poor outcome, that's very important to prevent the spacing happening too soon. But figures are still unacceptable. A national publication recently highlighted Louisiana's poor birth outcomes. For every thousand births in Louisiana in 2017, 7.6 babies died compared to 5.9 nationally. For African-American babies, these numbers are even worse. For every thousand born, 11.7 died. By no means are we done with our work. So we've made progress, but have a long way to go. What are the next steps? First, high blood pressure and diabetes can contribute to troublesome pregnancies. With Medicaid expansion, more Louisiana women are getting treatment for those conditions before they become pregnant, but not enough. We still have to make sure that every woman has a medical home, every woman has a primary care physician or nurse practitioner, and they're going and they're getting that care, number one. The second is improving hospital procedure and quality of care. Just like you get on a plane and your pilot does a checklist, and that makes you know then when you get on that plane that everything's been looked at, you don't keep it all in your head, you rely on a method. Similar to that, we're implementing checklists in hospitals. So do you have a hemorrhage card? So if someone starts to bleed, do you have everything there? Is it all in place so you don't have to go shuffling around looking for it when that starts to happen? But the infant mortality statistic captures health in the first year of life. It's not just the pregnancy and the birth to be concerned about. Guy says the medical community can go further. We wait until a woman has delivered a baby, the baby's ready to go home to start asking questions about a car seat, about safe sleep. Is there lead in the home? Is that home safe? The Department of Health has a program called the Nurse Family Partnership that follows a woman through pregnancy and into the first years of the child's life. It includes education and home visits. But we know that that low-cost intervention, the kinds of interventions that are being done in other countries, works. You can see so much when you go in a home visit. Governor John Bell Edwards' legislative package includes measures aimed at improving birth outcomes. When you look internationally, other nations are making a big dent in maternal mortality. It's going down here. It's going up. That's unacceptable. House Bill 818 would create the Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies Advisory Council. We need to address this problem uh, from a multi-sector perspective. We need to look at educational opportunities, healthcare opportunities, what's happening at the hospital, what's happening in primary care, and all of that needs to lead to better outcomes. So this is an exciting time. We know that we have legislative support, we have the governor's support, um, the community uh, uh, is activated around this issue, and we're going to solve this problem. It's just going to take uh, some time and some resources. The House overwhelmingly approved that bill on Wednesday afternoon. It may be non-controversial to support mothers on paper, but Andre, some of these solutions take money, which we know the state is short on. Absolutely. Kelly, thanks so much for that. And to find resources for first-time moms, you can visit nursefamilypartnership.org. A bill that will allow families to put video cameras in the nursing home room of a loved one is a step closer to becoming law. The State Nursing Association is against this bill, saying it would erode patient caregiver trust. Now, for seniors on Medicaid, the majority of state dollars go towards institutionalization instead of other long-term care. This month, Louisiana Public Square explores the imbalance in funding. Here's an excerpt. Well, as a nursing home administrator, and I've been doing it 22 years now, so I've got a lot of experience at it, uh, and we're definitely not opposed to folks being independent and staying at home, I mean, and that is the goal 
of any nursing home administrator in our facilities when they come into the facility is we want them to be independent and we work to help them be independent. Uh, there does come a time though that a individual needs long-term care and needs that specialized care that you really receive in a nursing home. It's kind of that one-stop shop that we were talking about earlier. I think the challenge really is that there aren't enough that, that, that we're going backwards uh, with our long-term care spending. As, as, as it was said during the opening, um, several states are moving towards more of a balance and Louisiana is going the exact opposite direction. Well, to Andrew's point, we don't disagree that people should live at home when it's appropriate. The nursing home industry in Louisiana actually now, Mr. Scott, sends more people back home after rehabilitative care than expire in the facility. We have to start now in thinking and taking some critical steps, making hard decisions and hard choices to create the system that is going to sustain us, the system that we want, the system that people are literally asking for. Um, we can do that, but it will take our industries to begin to relinquish some power and relinquish um, the power over the funds. Just to be clear, that the proposal that we're discussing is that managed care companies would make the choices for you. An insurance company would make the choice for you. Uh, Iowa is a managed care state. There is an article which discusses a person with Alzheimer's who was receiving home care. Her hours of home care was cut nearly in half because she quote unquote wasn't getting better. So it's not the person's choice, it's the insurance company's choice. I don't think that managed care is the, is the alternative. Uh, managed care has not been successful in most of the states where it's come up. We have been made so many promises in Louisiana about what we can do with health care that have not come to fruition. We were told we'll do away with our charity hospital system and we'll save money. We went from a $600 million uh, 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 bill on that to $1.1 billion. And I don't think we're, ex we're, we're providing more care, we're providing additional care, but I don't think we're providing better care. MCOs make their money by cutting services. There are 22 states that have done managed long-term supports and services and most of those states do report that they have either had savings or when you're talking about long-term care and the aging of the population to say you're going to save money it's probably more accurate to say you're going to reduce the growth of spending because the spending is always going to go up as demand goes up. But states like Florida, Massachusetts, Minnesota, several states, they've saved money from the same things you do with any managed care. They've avoided emergency room visits by getting people to go to the doctor okay, and do preventative okay. care. They've avoided rehospitalizations by being able to have better care coordination for somebody when they come out of the hospital. They're looking at a population that gets 15, 16 drugs sometimes and they're able to go in and say this is, some of these things are actually counteracting each other, not doing the person any good. So there are those typical kinds of savings that you can get. And then what Jean alluded to is that there is a mechanism that we use in our Medicaid program today and in a lot of other areas of the Medicaid budget where uh, the insurance companies pay a premium tax and that state can use that money to draw down additional federal match and bring in some additional dollars. So when you combine those two things, that's where you see a fiscal benefit. There is a premium tax that would be generated uh, on a managed care plan, but insurance companies don't do this for free. They charge an administrative fee. That administrative fee is going to eat up any potential revenue from a premium tax. So the, the, the latest bill that was filed by, um, by Senator Appel, the accountants at the legislature um, documented a two and a half million dollar cost. So it would pull money away from a system that it's already drained to basically fund an insurance company. In 2009, 2010, we had gotten to about a 40-60 balance and we've, we've gotten out of balance since then. And we have people, we have what's called home community-based waiver services that are frozen and have been frozen where people, that we had more of them and we have less than we had before. Um, do I think it's because we're a poorer state? Not exactly, I think it's just how, I think there's been, there have been laws passed um, that do protect the nursing home industry's rates and do protect the methodology of how those rates are done. And I think that that tends to um, put more money on that 77 Wait, you percent. Said, you said they protect the rates. Is that what I heard you say? Mm -hmm. Okay, so to, I, I, I don't, what does that mean, they protect the rates? Um, there is a constitutional amendment passed in 2014, and I might have that. Okay. Um, that actually says that the nursing home rates cannot be lowered 
Um, the D LDH cannot lower the rates arbitrarily unless they lower it the same percentage across the board for all Medicaid services or the legislature comes in and I do uh, two thirds or I okay, can't remember okay, one of these gentlemen might know. Yeah. But um, yeah, Senator it actually Lino's. does protect that rate where home and community based service rates are not protected and have gone down. Is that your perspective too, Senator Leno? Well, the first thing I disagree with is this, okay. this balance that we keep talking about 40, mm -hmm. 60, 50, 50, because mm -hmm. it's, it's my belief that the home health services are more expensive by the very nature of what you're doing. Instead of being in an institutional setting where you have a nurse who's going to care for multiple people, you have to have a nurse get in a vehicle and go to that person's home. That's more expensive by the very nature. It's not that it's better or worse, it's just more expensive. The other thing is when you, when you talk about guaranteeing rates uh, for nursing homes, we're, we're guaranteeing rates, but we're at the low, one of the lowest reimbursed states in the nation. So. Uh, and when you say reimbursement, what do you mean? And, and uh, who's reimbursing whom for the what? The reimbursement rates that, that, uh, that we do with on the Medicaid program. Okay, for Medicaid reimbursements to that's, the providers of the, of the health care services. That's okay, so, that's what you mean I by could, that. If I could just respond to you and say that <coughs> not everybody who receives nursing home services or everybody who receives home and community-based services needs a nurse to come to them. And so to say that is not exactly true, and the service of the services are less expensive. But I mean, if, but if uh, they go in a nursing home, they do need a nurse. They no, do need not necessarily. No, no, it's, it's not, the exact same. It's correct. the exact same eligibility requirements. And no, they do not need to have nursing services according to what the eligibility requirements are. That is not well, exactly I, I, true. Balancing Elder Care, it re-airs Sunday, April 29th at 11 a.m. You can also view this program online at lpb.org slash public square. Our next story is about the power of words. Donnie Rose of Baton Rouge is one of America's top spoken word poets and teacher working with the nonprofit Forward Arts. Now, this weekend, in what amounts to the Super Bowl of spoken word poetry, his students will compete in the All City Poetry Slam Finals. The Kennedy Center just honored him for his work. We begin this piece with his poem called Last Words. And the preacher said, Come to Jesus while the blood is still running warm in your veins. And the blood said, when my skin spreads the pavement, I don't feel warm, I'm at my boiling point. And Jesus said, woolly-haired, bronze-skinned twin, I see they have not stopped crucifying those who they don't quite understand. And the soloist said, precious Lord, take my hand. And the mother of the dead black boy said, and the cop said, you reach, I teach. But the block said, he just wanted to go home. And the cop's gun said, I need to request some time off. And the bullet said, all these frequent flyer miles. And I always seem to travel to dark destinations, no matter the time of day. And the church folk said, amen. Because saying how the hell would have been considered sinful. And sin said, your skin is always my alibi. And the casket said, son, I was molded in your image. And the father of the dead black boy said, Lord, why not me? And the news reporter said the victim was caught stealing just last week. And the grim reaper grinned and said, that boy was a petty thief. At best, I can show you a thing or two about taking things. And the usher said, God's got him now. And the floorboards wept and the pews collapsed and the painting of Caesar Barger smirked and the dead black boy said. What it talks about is not great, but um, it's a message we can all understand. Huh? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, should understand. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell me about forward arts. We do a plethora of things. Um, most, most prominently is our in-school creative writing workshop where we go to varying middle and high schools teaching creative writing through uh, spoken word poetry. We also have an after school program called Word Crew, which is our youth poetry ambassadors. We have a monthly teen open mic called Fresh Heat, which has gone on for the last 12 years. We have an annual teen poetry slam festival called All City, which uh, finalizes Saturday, April 28th. What does teaching what you teach, what does that teach the children? Primarily, it gives them a level of voice and engagement. 
uh, this idea that creative expression is a means to get um, their message out. Uh, we live in a world and in a society and in an area where it is said that children are to be seen and not heard. Kids can be inwardly involved in social media and right. not part of really delivering their voice publicly right. and in person. Right, so right. This does that. Yeah, because what, what, what many young people are looking for is a platform. And so social media often offers an unfiltered platform, right? And so what we try to replicate in real life and what we have been replicating even before there was a Twitter or before a Facebook is this idea of here's a platform, uh, here's a microphone, here's a captive audience, here are people who are willing to listen to what you have to say. You taught them well, I would suspect, because of their success, but uh, then you've also been honored uh, mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. in a great way. Mm -hmm. The Kennedy Center honors. Yes, yes. How that came about, uh, a lady by the name of Maida Owens, who works for the Louisiana Division of the Arts, reached out to me back in December and said that she wanted to nominate me for the uh, Kennedy Center Citizen Artist Fellow uh, recognition. Long story short, four months later, I get an email from the Kennedy Center saying, congrats, you've been chosen as one of our 2018, 2019 Kennedy Center Citizen Artist Fellows. And I was like, well, that's, that's cool. And then I realized that I was one of five people. And then I, then I realized that I was the only person from the South. Wow. And I was like, oh, okay, this is a lot bigger than, 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 uh, than I initially thought. The theme of the summit was the future states of America. So it was a lot of conversation about how the arts can move us in a direction where we want to be. Again, that competition is Saturday, April 28th, 6 p.m., Manship Theater, Baton Rouge, the All City Teen Poetry Finals. That's our show for this week, everyone. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.